Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Edward Bond's play, Nehru Road to the Deep North. Now, this is, in principle, inspired by uh, something written by the 16th, uh, sorry, 17th century Japanese poet Basho, who was a master of the haiku form, but he also wrote travel narratives. Um, Nehru Road to the Deep North, as a play doing conceptual work in the line of Bond's rational theater is a, a, a reasonably interesting play. That's one of two ways I'm going to look at this play, as a conceptual play within Bond's schema. So, as a reminder, the rational theater is a not entirely clearly explained concept, in my opinion, um, that Bond... Basically, what Bond envisions the role of theater to be is that it prompts viewers to ask questions, critical questions about the world, um, to explore and to interrogate the sociocultural circumstances in which they find themselves. How exactly this differs from Brecht's epic theater, for instance, is where I'm not quite clear. I think I think the distinction is that whereas, maybe this is the distinction, whereas Brecht uh, relies on the Werfremdungseffekt, or the, the distancing effect or alienation effect to sort of point people toward, hey, what you're seeing is an artistic representation that should be getting you to ask critical questions about the socio-cultural conditions in which you find yourself. The rational theater does not do that. The rational theater utilizes naturalism, or more naturalistic storylines, performances, etc., etc., to get people to critically ask questions about the sociocultural conditions in which they find themselves. So, a uh, narrow road to the deep north isn't as naturalistic, I would say, as a play like The Sea, but it is moving in that direction. So the basic storyline follows Basho, who again was a, a 17th century Japanese poet. He goes to the deep north for 30 years, then he returns to the south, this is the south of Japan, um, and he finds that the city, which apparently there is one city in, in the south of Japan, uh, is now run by a guy named Shogo. Shogo is um, the basically son of peasants who became a bandit and managed to conquer the city and kill the emperor, and he now rules with an iron fist. Um, as Basho says, uh, in scheming with, with Shogo's prime minister, he says, He's imprisoned innocent women, orphaned children, made the men soldiers, and killed them. His city is hell, ruled by atrocity. I could put up with it if that, uh, with that, I could put up with that if I could still hope. But how can I hope if he destroys religion? Uh, incidentally, the, one of the other major characters, uh, in this is Kiro, who is, who initially is introduced as just sort of sitting alongside a road, and he, he, Basho is like, yes, I've gone to the north and gotten enlightenment. And Kiro's like, let me be your disciple. And Basho's like, no, go to the seminary. So Kiro goes and becomes a priest, uh, or he becomes a seminary student, like on his way toward being a Buddhist priest. Um, he eventually like gets, like he becomes Shogo's like buddy, and they hang out for a while. Uh, but Kiro, in a drunken prank, uh, decided to stick a sacred pot over his head to the amusement of his fellow monks in training. Uh, the problem was that uh, Kiro's head got stuck and the pot started to cut off his airflow. And they tried to get various people to help, uh, including Basho, who was unable to do it, uh, including like witches and wise men and whatever fucking things along the road. Um, and then they, they got to this um, they got to the palace um, 
and Shogo was like, yeah, I'm going to fucking smash this pot so this dude won't die. So, and they, I mean, they're not pleased with that because it's a sacred relic. So that's the background here. Um, but how can I hope if he destroys religion? He knew the pot was sacred. Of course, that's only a symbol, but we need symbols to protect us from ourselves. If he destroys them, there's no future. A fool destroys men, but a fanatic destroys their hope, and he's a fanatic. So, Basho and the Prime Minister leave the south. They go to the north, where Basho has apparently met some barbarians. Uh, the barbarians are a British commodore and his sister slash lover. It's kind of a weird thing because they refer to each other as brother and sister. Basho tells the prime minister that they do that for appearances, but they're actually lovers. It's not 100% clear. Um, it's a weird kind of thing. But uh, the... Basho, when he had been in the north before, had told the Commodore, yeah, there's not really anything in the south. It's just sort of desert. Um, in an attempt to prevent the British from coming in and colonizing the south of Japan. Basho now goes back and he's like, hey, yeah, um, there's a whole big prosperous city that you might want to come take over. Um, the guy who runs it's kind of a dick. He killed the proper emperor. This is the baby emperor that I've been entrusted with. Um, so let's go overthrow this society. The Commodore, being a British imperialist, jumps on this idea. Um, Georgina, the sister, I don't know if I said her name before, uh, she's like, we will agree, provided I can make everyone Jesus freaks. Like, literally, she is very, like, fanatically religious and, like, going around with a tambourine singing like hallelujah and bits of hymns all the time like all all the time so uh basho and the prime minister agree they go they do that uh because they have guns and the japanese under shogo don't uh the the conquest is fairly quick at which point um the commodore is sort of running society semi-benevolently um, Georgina is converting everybody by force, whether they actually understand that they're being converted or what Christianity entails or not. Um, so that's her whole thing. But interestingly enough, we learn that Georgina actually doesn't give a shit about religion. Um, apparently she learned Japanese in an hour so the Prime Minister and Basho are sort of talking about what's going on, and Georgina interjects in Japanese. Um, and then Georgina says, uh, Basho's like, you speak Japanese? And Georgina's like, I had a spare hour last Wednesday, and I thought it would be useful. I might, uh, I want to be able to talk to intelligent people. My brother has a lot of good qualities. Yes, he has, but no one could deny he's a bore. That's why they sent him out here. The English send all their bores abroad in a and acquired the empire as a punishment, she laughs. Those poor priests shouting hallelujah and banging their tambourines. Basho says, do you mean you weren't sincere? Georgina says, did you, th did you think I was? And basically what she explains is that she is running this portion of the British Empire not through force, so not in the way that Shogo ran his his domain through violence and murder, but she's running it through a sort of ideological, by making religion an ideological state apparatus. Basically, she has made religion a tool through which she can control the hearts and minds of the people. Um, Shogo, in the north, who, where he's fled to, along with Kiro, um, they raise an army, to reconquer the South, uh, which they managed to do, because very conveniently, uh, Shogo has bought a bunch of guns from an Arab trader who happened to have washed up on the shores of Japan with a ton of guns he was looking to sell. Uh, so they go back down, they attack the British forces, it goes back and forth, it looks like the British are losing, then uh, the British end up winning. Um, Shogo is executed, and, yeah, 
So, I mean, on a thematic level, the play is interesting because it's not a simple and straightforward critique of imperialism, which it might very well be by just making the British villains and the, the Japanese sympathetic victims of that colonialism. What Bond actually does that's rather interesting in my perspective is he gives us a sort of third alternative, that the Japanese people suffer regardless of who the rulers are, whether it's Shogo the warlord or the Commodore in the British Empire. Either way, the common people of Japan suffer. And this is actually quite a good socialist perspective, and Bond was a socialist. Um, this is quite a good socialist perspective because one risk with anti-colonial sentiment, particularly a lot of sort of Western Marxist anti-colonial sentiment, is that it can risk glorifying indigenous forms of oppression and violence because they are not colonial. So Bond pushes back on that. The idea that, oh, the indigenous Japanese, whether that's the imperial court or that Shogo's um, authoritarianism, that these things are inherently good because they're not British imperialism. Bond doesn't seem to accept that. And I think that's a, a much more sophisticated position than some of his contemporaries and, and sort of ideological fellow travelers took in the 60s and, and early 70s. Um, this comes out in 68, I think. Yeah, 68. So, there's that. Now, the other... So that's the first way that I wanted to talk about this play, is the conceptual thematic level. The second way is as a history play, because this is a history play of sorts. And there, boy howdy, it is a fucking train wreck. As a history play, Narrow Road to the Deep North is dreadful. Uh, so let's start even from before the play itself. In the uh, in the description, the, the setting information from beforehand, it says, Japan, about the 17th, 18th, or 19th century. Oh, I can read that. Oh, no. Japan, 17th, 18th, or 19th centuries. What this might imply to a British audience uh, or to a British director in 1968 is that three centuries, Japan was just the same. It was just Japan. You know, they didn't change. Nothing occurred. There was nothing of note, really. It's just a eh, big old mishmash of rice patties and whatever. So this is a, a huge problem for me. Um, I, I this is a this is starting right from the beginning. Massive cultural insensitivity. I think uh, it's also worth noting if you look down the cast list here for the original production. You're not going to be able to read all, uh, that all that well. No, apparently Japanese names in the cast list. No seeming East Asian names whatsoever. Uh, this is white British people performing as mostly Japanese characters. So, not helping. Uh, not, not, not good. Uh, the first thing that happens in the introduction to the play, um, Basho comes on stage. He says, my name is Basho. I am, as you know, the great 17th century Japanese poet who brought the haiku verse form to perfection and gave it greater range or depth. Okay, not untrue, but probably not a thing that Basho would have said about himself. But, you know, that's okay. Then, oh boy. For example, Silent Old Pool, Frog Jumps, Kadang. If you wanted to show that this is a good poet, and Basho was a fucking spectacular poet, if you wanted to show an audience of British people who probably are not that familiar with haiku in 1968, that this is a good poetic form, this is a bad example. This is a terrible 
thing. It is just nonsense. Uh, so Basho explains that he has left his village. He's going to the deep north. Uh, he is going there to uh, try and gain enlightenment. In the first actual scene of the play, after the introduction, he comes back on and he's like, 30 years since I was here. Now, that dramatically is not a terrible thing, but historically it is wrong. Um, Basho did actually go to the north of the main island of Japan, um, to Honshu Prefecture, I believe. The whole trip was about half a year. Basho did not spend 30 years in Honshu Prefecture. He did not spend a long time in the Deep North. He did not go for enlightenment. Um, he spent a short amount of time on the whole trip, including going from, I think he lived near Kyoto at the time, which is sort of southern-ish Japan. So he went to the north, the, the trip up, staying there and back half a year, not 30 years. So right off the bat, we are fucking wrong about Basho's own autobiography, literally the thing that was theoretically the inspiration for this. Um, so we've got that bit. Now, um, the role of the Commodore and Georgina. Now, they make sense from a thematic perspective because Bond is taking issue with colonialism, British colonialism in particular. He's a British author, etc., etc. The problem is, Basho lived during what's called the Edo period in Japan. The Edo period was isolationist. The only foreigners allowed in Japan during the Edo period, there was a small, um, there was a small trading outpost in, I think, Hiroshima, run by the Dutch. The Dutch were allowed to keep this one trading post. Other than, than that, no. Foreigners were not allowed. The British were not allowed. Arabs were not allowed. So the two groups of people whom Basho or Shogo interact with, who are foreigners, would not be there during the Edo period. Um, I think it was 1868 that Commodore Matthew Perry of the U.S. Navy shows up with a warship and is basically like, hey, Japan, guess what? You're open for trade now. And the Japanese were like, we don't really want to. And Matthew Perry was like, yes, well, here's guns. So Now, that's a great dramatic event. If you were Bond, you could have fucking dramatized that if you were concerned about imperialism in a Japanese context. But no. Uh, he makes up this nonsense that historically is completely incoherent. It makes no sense whatsoever. Um, in the 17th century, when Basho lived, there were simply no British, imperi uh, British imperial forces in Japan. It is not accurate. We also get this uh, sort of brief description of the guns that, that Shogo has bought and how they function. It's not 100% clear exactly, because this, the um, the um, the description that Shogo gives could be applied to a couple of different models of guns. Um, so what he says here is, so he shows them a bullet. Bullet is a somewhat generic term. So this could refer to, say, a round musket ball, but normally, I think, in the 17th century, 18th century, when uh, into the 19th century, when musket balls were being used, musket ball was the more common term. Bullet I think is more commonly a term used for, say, contemporary cartridge-style bullets in which you have a brass shell filled with gunpowder and a, a firing pin, or, um, sorry, a, um, I can't think of the name of it, the little bit that explodes when you hit it with the, the hammer of the gun, whatever, and then the bullet in front of it, and you insert it into the gun. Um, so what Shogo says is, now first pull this little stick, and there's a little hole. That could be theoretically a ramrod taken out. 
but that's kind of a long stick to describe as a little stick. That could also be something like a um, the bolt on a bolt action rifle. You pull on a bolt action rifle. If the rifle is along here, you pull back and you pull up and back, and that opens the chamber on the gun. Um, push the bullet in like that and push a little stick like that. Now it's up inside. So that can be closing the action on a bolt action rifle. That could theoretically be um, using the ramrod to drive a bullet down a barrel in a muzzle loader. The reason I don't think it's that, though, is because the next thing is when you're ready, squeeze this little curved thing below, that be the trigger, and it goes bang and shoots through the top. And there's your dead man. If you're using a muzzle loader, there's an additional step or a couple of steps, depending on what type of muzzle loader you're using. If you're using a flintlock, you have to prime, you have to pull back the hammer halfway, prime the pan, lower the the, um, the striker, pull the, the hammer back all the way. If you're using a cap lock musket, you have to pull the hammer back halfway, put a uh, firing cap, musket cap on the uh, the nipple of the the gun pull the hammer back all the way before you can fire. So there's additional steps that Shogo doesn't show his men. So I'm thinking this is a much more modern weapon, which again is just historical soup of random fucking shit that does not fit together in to give an accurate history of what was going on. And again, I don't think Bond's intention is really to write an accurate history play, so I'm not faulting him for that so much, even though it does bother me personally, but the fact that Bond has chosen to set this this story in Japan with a character who lived at a particular historical period that had historical realities, and he's just ignored all of those for the sake of making his own point, I actually do find really problematic. This, to me, is a kind of orientalist fantasy, right? So, so on the one hand, it is utilizing Japan as a location stripped of all of the specificities of Japanese culture, history, etc. On the other hand, it is... It's, it, it, it's the thing that, that Orientalists often do where the East, the Orient, whatever it is, becomes a sort of general signifier for foreign stuff. And that's the end of it. And it's an incredibly problematic and racist approach from somebody who I think ideologically should have known better. 